recorded. Here is Martin K., our invited speaker, that was not recorded before. So Martin is checking out the Ustream that we're using. And now the next session comes. I think I don't need chairing. It's not me. Is it the Daphne? I'm it's not. No, no. no, no. I'm not doing anything. Now you're just enjoying. Yeah. So there is our next speaker. Do you want to check the setup of plugin or? <laughs> yeah, he's it, it, uh, using uh, someone's uh, city. Do you have the adapter? Um, this, this is probably the same. Yeah, it is. Okay. 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 Yeah, it is.
<laughs> Did I push something? Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, and uh, then the general architecture, which is based on the uh, Apertron uh, platform. Uh, I'll uh, then say what resources we used in creating this because we did use a lot of existing resources um, and what we, uh, how we integrated those into the system. And finally, uh, our evaluation, which is um, based on uh, uh, trying to measure how well users actually understand the text and um, uh, what we use the, the, the uh, non-standard uh, way of evaluating because the measures like word error rate don't really measure understanding. Um, yeah, so the languages. Um, North Sami is uh, definitely a minority language uh, and um, somewhere around 20,000 speakers. Um, well, in, um, well, the majority language in Norway, Norwegian has uh, five million and of course this um, don't uh, <laughs> the majority does not uh, understand North Sami, uh, which is uh, a, from a completely different language family, and um, also the you know, sort of intrinsic linguist linguistic uh, differences are great. Um, there's uh, a very different lexicon, and uh, North Sami is, uh, has a rich morphology. Uh, so there's um, compared to Norwegian, which is Fairly simple. Um, for example, uh, you have a lot of noun cases that um, that you use nouns as uh, adverbs, um, where in Norwegian you would use a preposition. Also, you can do all kinds of things on the verb itself, uh, which in Norwegian you would use um, auxiliaries for. Uh, so the languages themselves are really different, and uh, Norwegians. Uh, the majority don't understand Sami. So uh, it is useful um, in this situation to have um, a sort of gisting translator from Sami to Norwegian. Uh, in the other direction, it wouldn't be as useful because most Sami speakers do understand Norwegian and they wouldn't have need for uh, just an understanding translator, but it might be useful if the quality were really good so that you could use it for, for uh, post editing. Um, but we go for the low-hanging fruit first, um, hopefully later on some of the experiences here can help create uh, translate in the other direction. Should I uh, plug it in or something? Um, yeah, so this is probably not readable, but I'll just quickly go through the um, the architecture. Uh, it's based on Unix pipelines where you have different modules that each have a well-defined task. Uh, the source text is first uh, stripped of, uh, of formatting, or it's, the formatting is hidden away, and the content is uh, put into a morphological analyzer that uh, for each form uh, finds the, you know, the lemmas and tags. Uh, which, of course, is ambiguous. So we have a disambiguator that hopefully selects the right one for each, uh, for each uh, form. And uh, then we have lexical transfer, which um, is not shown as a separate module there, but it is in newer language first. It uh, takes uh, source language, uh, unambiguous lemmas and tags, and appends the target language lemma tags that correspond. Uh, an example of tag translation might be from a feminine noun to a masculine noun. Um, and that's defined in this uh, transfer lexicon. Um, then we have structural transfer, which can be uh, one stage or several stages uh, in, in uh, translation between distant languages. It's uh, typically based on first chunking together uh, Noun phrases uh, and maybe reordering within the noun phrase, uh, maybe changing some tags to make determiners match nouns and so on. Then uh, you have a, a more abstracted um, transfer stage that 
takes whole chunks and moves, moves them around. Um, and finally, uh, so some cleanup transfer. Then this is uh, given to the morphological generator that does that set of analyzer turns target language, uh, lemmas and tags into the target language forms. And finally, we reapply any formatting that was hidden away. So that's the general architecture. Um, and the analyzer, the generator, and the lexical transfer are all um, all use uh, finite state transducers uh, for quickly uh, uh, translating. And this is the specific pipeline in this language pair. Um, one thing about uh, this that's different is that we use uh, a sort of uh, newer uh, finite state transducer technology. Um, typically, a perturbium pairs use um, something called LT toolbox, which is a really fast finite state transducer. Um, we use that for generation and uh, the transfer lexicon, but um, for the analysis, we, um, we use a different tool set, which I'll come back to. Um, we also don't do statistical uh, disambiguation, which is common in, uh, in uh, perturbium pairs, but we use uh, something called the constraint grammar, uh, which uh, is uh, a lot of handwritten rules. Um, uh, for the disambiguation, we have um, you know, how many rules? Three and a half thousand. Three and a half thousand, yeah. <laughs> um, and they do, some of them are fairly simple. I mean, you could have a rule that says, if I'm ambiguous and I uh, am a possible finite verb and there's no other finite verb in the sentence, then choose the finite verb reading. Um, that, that would be a very simple one, but you can have more constraints like is there a noun to the left, is there a verb to the left. Um, and that's used for uh, you know, selecting or removing readings on the ambiguous uh, forms. Um, and we also use lexical selection, uh, uh, constraint grammar for lexical selection, which is um, when you've done morphological disambiguation, you might still have several translations um, for, uh, say, a verb or something. Uh, and the lexical selection constraint grammar uses the same kinds of methods, but instead of selecting uh, reading, it uh, puts a subscript uh, to a lemma in a certain context. So, um, uh, like bank, if it's the word of bank, might be bank zero, and the financial institution might be bank one, and that's uh, matched in the lexical transfer. Um, yeah, and we have four stages of structural transfer, which uh, is one more than the regular, I guess. Um, Helsinki finite state tools is what we use for um, the morphological analysis um, of some. Um, there's several reasons for using this as opposed to the regular LP toolbox um, tool set. One is that um, there's a lot of grammars already written um, that, uh, or morphologies already written that um, are possible to analyze in, these, in this tool set. Um, because it, um, it uh, basically does the same as the Xerox finite state tools, you know, only it's all free software. And for anyone who's worked on computational linguistics, the Xerox tools are sort of ubiquitous. You know, yeah. <laughs> There's a whole lot of analyzers written for these. Um, and it also has a lot more expressive power or power to make generalizations in uh, the morphology. Um, one uh, one thing it, uh, it allows is to uh, have a sort of memory as you're analyzing a string. Typically, when uh, when you're working on finite state transducers, uh, simple ones, you um, you see some input and you put out some out output, and you don't um, you don't remember anything but except for the state that you're in. Um, and so if there's dependencies between the early parts of the word and the latter parts of the word, then you have to enumerate all those possibilities uh, instead of uh, having um, like suffix paradigms that, uh, that are written separately from the prefix paradigms. 
So uh, that's the thing they, they can, you can do with uh, Helsinki Final State tools that makes uh, analyzers more uh, readable and, and maintainable. It is a bit slower at run, but uh, I'm, I haven't done any real comparable tests, but like, the Salmi is 20 times slower than the Norwegian um, analyzer. So, um, yeah. Those are the tools we use. Uh, constraint grammar, I think the next talk will uh, introduce a bit more. Um, the resources we use. Uh, on the Sami side, most of it, I guess most of it was already made by uh, the University of Tomsa groups. Um, there's a uh, uh, digitized uh, dictionary uh, from the Sami to Norwegian. And that was automatically converted, I think, by Francis Towers. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it was, um, it in, uh, enlarged the dictionary by quite a bit, but we had to manually check it for uh, uh, some entries. For example, this one that was really explanatory. Uh, one word translating into a whole phrase, that's not really. Uh, it doesn't doesn't uh, create really uh, readable translations, I and mean, there's a lot of problems uh, in transfer when you have different forms of the source word. Um, other than that, the rest of the translation of the dictionary, I think, was mostly manually created. Um, got some scripting involved, um, so it's it's pretty big actually uh, compared to. Uh, a lot of the dictionaries in encryption, but still 20,000 could be a, a lot bigger. Um, yeah. um, and the analyzer and the disambiguator were already created at the University of Tunisia um, as sort of general language resources um, before we started work on, on the language tab. And um, this we, we automatically converted to our system and we try to maintain collaboration uh, up and down between those, the projects. Uh, the Norwegian generator we just copied over from the, from the Norwegian Union School mode pair and approaching mode or some change. So we had a lot of resources to, uh, to begin with. Um, one thing that we did do with the analyzer is uh, trim it down to the size of the translational dictionary. Um, this is important to avoid getting half translations. If we if we have a word that's ambiguous between um, uh, between two possible readings and only one of the readings has a translation in the translational lexicon, then um, if that one's chosen, then the user sees just a lemmatized sound word, and that's not useful, especially not in, in simulation transfer, uh, translation. So. Um, to avoid that and also to avoid a lot of transfer bugs, um, we trim it down so that we know that all possible readings that we can get, we can have a translation for. That's done with the script that runs in less than 10 seconds, so it's easy to, uh, to uh, work uh, uh, on the source uh, analyzer and uh, not have to do manual work. Uh, we also uh, uh, exclude some derivations that are defined in the analyzer, because there are a lot of derivations in this analyzer that, um, it, because it's supposed to you know, have great coverage and it's supposed to show all the real possible morphological uh, phenomena in, in its own. Um, but if, if we don't know how to translate them, well, uh, we can't use them. So we uh, prune those out uh, with um, a finite state transistor that's composed onto the uh, analyzer and just says that this because it has that derivation tag is really cool. Um, and that approaches is uh, also lexicalized entries. So uh, that's a, what we did to ensure we could have good collaboration and, and uh, minimize the manual labor involved in that. Um, similarly with the constraint grammar, we um, use scripting to do some minor tag formats conversion, but other than that, we uh, work on the uh, upstream uh, project, uh, that is the 
University of Homeless Project, and then uh, automatically it's written into the translator. Um, the lexical selection constraint kernel was created more or less from scratch. Um, we did copy over some uh, semantic sets and stuff like that from the disambiguator, and that's really useful in uh, lexical selection. So um, I'd say that this word did it can become either um, uh, to ask something of someone or to fish. Um, we only want the fish translation if there's a fish in the sentence or some something related to fish in the sentence, um, because uh, the ask one is uh, more common. Than, uh, um, yeah. Uh, and also, this, there's uh, rules that work on uh, stuff like um, uh, verb and uh, balancing. Um, that's, yeah. Uh, but the, the lexical section constraint grammar is uh, quite small um, at the moment. But it's really useful for some core verbs like uh, uh, layout, which is either to be or to have. And that's <laughs> quite important. So, um, very useful there. But, um, could be. We could work more on it. Um, yeah. One problem with having uh, an analyzer that was you know, created already without necessarily being created for this project is that the tag set is, of course, completely different. And um, initially, at least, the tag set was not very strict either. There were um, inconsistencies and uh, yeah, it was hard to get an, an overview. Um, so, um, tag, uh, changing the tags in the analyzer itself would not really have been feasible because then we would have basically forked the analyzer and uh, created our own analyzer. Um, and also, the constraint grammar expects a certain tag set. So, changing it in there uh, to match the virtual tag set would have uh, been a lot of work. What we do is we uh, translate the tag set online as, uh, as we're uh, translating uh, text. Um, in the translational dictionary, we have these uh, paradigms that uh, say uh, this string of Sami tags corresponds to this string of uh, uh, Persian region tags. Um, and that includes doing stuff like uh, uh, finding possible translations of derivations and, um, and simple things like uh, tenses and such. Um, but yeah, because uh, because the tag set was uh, really big and really uh, complex, it uh, did lead to a lot of bugs. But I don't think um, I still can see a, <laughs> a better way to, to do it. Uh, I think also the analyzer did become a lot, um, did get a lot cleaner tag set because of uh, what we did have eventually. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah. Structural transfer. This was created from scratch, of course, for the system. Um, we have four stages um, and quite a lot of rules compared to most opportune pairs. Um, but uh, I guess the things we do are fairly standard. We jump noun phrases, we uh, change adverbial cases into prepositions. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, <laughs> so, okay, I won't go into <laughs> this stuff. You can ask me later about it. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, structural transfer is fun working on, um, but we need to, need to do more to uh, cover all the constructions. Um, Derivations was sort of a problem. Um, it involves a lot of guessing and uh, transfer bugs because of it. We try um, we try to uh, take advantage of uh, possible uh, forms in the target language rather than inventing forms. Uh, so, if there's a verb driving into an actor noun, then we take the um, the present tense of the Norwegian word because it is ambiguous with actor nouns in many cases. But yeah, derivations involve guessing, and that's um, 
that's uh, a difficulty. Uh, it, it creates a lot of um, it creates a lot of uh, added um, coverage when you're just working on the analyzer and seeing things from the analyzer side, but uh, that coverage is not necessarily that useful in translation. Uh, lexicalized entries uh, get you get you straight into the word that you want uh, without transfer complexity and without uh, guessing. Um, well, at least uh, for uh, single words, and uh, assuming that you're you don't have that high quality needs. Uh, but lexicalizing takes a lot of time. Um, so we try to find a middle ground where we uh, uh, make transfer rules for the high frequency uh, derivations. Um, if we find some acceptable way of translating them. Um, or we also preserve meaning. Um, yeah. So evaluation. Uh, I'll first give the sort of standard numbers, uh, coverage and uh, word error rate, and then move on to um, the more uh, different uh, evaluation. Um, so coverage, including the derivation, is good. Um, 94%, uh, I mean, every 20th word will be untranslated, but uh, getting those last percent percentage points uh, is really hard. But we see that it, it drops quite a lot when we remove derivations. Um, so they are uh, useful in increasing coverage, uh, definitely. Um, the reason why the wiki is so much slower, I think, is just because the wiki is not very good and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the coverage is actually quite high. Um, yeah. um, the word error rate shows that it's not really useful for post-editing. Um, uh, I've done more extensive tests, you know, tests than this, but I, um, I have a, <laughs> a feeling that we'd have to get it a lot better before even considering something like that. Um, what do you mean by the uh, Oh, uh, when you're um, uh, given a machine translation, uh, you try to fix it up to be publishable text, and then you uh, see from the machine translation and into what you, what you fixed it into, how many changes were there. Uh, as in how many substitutions uh, of words or um, insertions of words. Um, so uh, a good one would be at least below 20% uh, for you know, being useful in saving time as a translator uh, who uses machine translation as a tool. Mm -hmm. So uh, we devised three tests for trying to uh, measure understanding. Um, given a uh, Sami uh, text, um, I think it was Tom who um, uh, tried to write three paraphrases without looking at the machine translation output um, <coughs> of that uh, Sami sentence. Uh, paraphrases into Norwegian where two of them were wrong in some important, important way, like uh, changing out some content word or uh, adding, adding a negation or uh, changing a uh, pronoun. Um, and uh, the user got to see the Sami and the machine translation and the paraphrases, and using the machine translation had to pick which paraphrase corresponded. So that should test if uh, we've, we've gotten if we like, changed some indication, that would be horrible. So um, that should measure some understanding. Second test similarly created, only instead of paraphrases, we have an open question. Uh, some fact is presented in the machine translation output, and um, the question asks about that fact. In this case, uh, I don't think people answered correctly, really, because the answer would be uh, from both countries. Um, what we have there is what was on the countries. Uh, <laughs> not really um, useful. So um, uh, that, that was, that's an example of where they would get the, the wrong uh, answer, answer or wrong question. Um, the last one was generated. Uh, so um, 
uh, the questions were automatically created. Uh, here, uh, we took the we took a reference translation from a parallel corpus, and uh, for two nouns of a certain length, um, we found other nouns in the same text, thus from the same having some similar meaning, hopefully, of about the same length. Um, and with the same logical analysis, um, and uh, made a multiple choice there. So one of these, uh, in this case, government was from the original um, uh, reference translation, and the rest were picked uh, randomly. And the user had to choose which one was uh, right. Uh, in this case, the mission between translation was good, so. Uh, the word government is shown there, and the user should be able to say that it is government and not county, which uh, could be a possible alternative. Um, so we have some numbers that uh, in themselves aren't uh, that useful until we can compare them to other systems, I guess. Um, uh, the multiple choice ones, of course, are higher than open question. But then every third will randomly be right when you have only three choices. Uh, so there's some uh, possible getting random uh, choices right. But still, um, I guess the fact that um, four, four out of 20, 10 open question sentences is at least percent of the fact correctly right? means that um, at least <laughs> uh, they did get some understanding. And also considering that there are several facts presented per sentence, that's not that bad. Um, but yeah, uh, it's difficult to say how to um, how to interpret this without having tested more languages. Uh, we didn't get around to that yet. Um, uh, the, the, when looking at the errors, we see that we do need to work more on disintegration. Um, some important uh, closed category words uh, are wrong, and uh, we might also want to try to train a statistical tiger to um, um, to uh, work after the constraint grammar, um, because it does sometimes leave some ambiguity. Other than that, uh, we plan on well, expanding the dictionary in this, uh, uh, and the structural <coughs> principles to catch more phenomena. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's pretty much it. Questions? Yeah, so, um, Sami is a subject object verb. Uh, language, is that right? Uh, it's, uh, SVO. <coughs> it, it is basically SVO, but it's much easier to, if you have some auxiliary, then there is a tendency to have S, AUX, O, V, although you can also have S, AUX, V, O. So, mm -hmm. and, but, in, but the word order is quite free, so you should really not rely on that. Including moving the verb order. Uh, well, within limits, yes, okay. <laughs> within limits. <laughs> so, anyway, my question was, um, because of the differences in word order, um, what, do, you, do you trace any of your difficulties to that? Um, I'm not, no, I, I don't think that was the main uh, problem, really. I, what, what does that mean? Uh, well, as in, did it detract uh, understanding quality a lot? I, don't, from the errors I looked at, I don't think that was the main problem. Uh, most of the sentences do have very similar word order um, from the ones that, that I looked at. Um, and, and the missing me V second, was of course. Yeah, case. yeah. The, the V second thing uh, in Norwegian have a specific constraint on where to put the, uh, the word in the sentence. So. Sometimes that happens, but I, I don't think that detracts that much from uh, understanding. Although uh, the fact that we don't cover all constructions means that we sometimes um, miss out on uh, inserting pronouns or we insert too many pronouns because we don't catch all possible uh, 
world order combinations. Uh, so, in that sense, it, it does become kind of important. Uh, we did have one example in the article, I think, where um, uh, a pronoun was inserted that uh, uh, made the understanding worse because we inserted too many pronouns. What we would be interested in is feedback on evaluating existing translator because uh, uh, this is, for example, what statistical translation usually does. But but uh, since we do rule based, we we uh, we don't find any joy in, in, in blur. So then we have to come up with an alternative, and this is our. And in the literature, we haven't found any, which is to us strange. Perhaps we haven't looked enough. But we are this we are really interested in. So probably we found evaluation paraphrasing systems or summarizing systems, but not yeah. really in gene translation. So one thing I thought was missing from the evaluation was. Um, Baseline numbers. Yes. So how how much can people get from the text without machine translation? From from just the song. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was an interesting question. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so probably they uh, <laughs> they were zero. But we, we could do that. But then we'll be able to take into account the guessing factor. The, yeah, yeah. Because people will guess. They'll use yeah. yeah. their yeah. world knowledge and they'll guess it. Exactly. We could try. They were quite angry as if we are the informants. But yeah, we because we did a similar thing. You would have to have shorter tests because it was really frustrating. We did a similar thing for the past English translator. And yeah. we did a baseline, which was just given the last sentence, mm -hmm. and the numbers were for with the translator they were similar to yours, and without the translator they were something like thirty percent. Okay, yeah, so that's that, that was a swap cutting exercise. So yeah. uh, we gave them the, the sentence with some holes, and they had to put words yeah, in the holes. I took that test. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you did. I also. <laughs> no way. But I mean, there's, in the real world, the real world doesn't come with with, with three alternatives. The real world comes with yeah, the text. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> but at least this you can do. You can at least do the. So the open question. The open exactly. questions would, would. The open questions would really be, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ex except that when you ask the open question in Norwegian, yeah. then you already have translated half the sentence yeah, yeah, yeah. anyway. Yeah. So that's a problematic part. There is you don't have the baseline anymore. And, uh, another problem is uh, like like with the test uh, of the Basque, it was yeah. all from the same text model. Yes. Uh, but that's I mean, realistic. That is realistic. But uh, I mean, how much uh, of it do you want to show? And, yeah. and that kind of question. Uh, I mean, well, you, can, you can devise tests fix, uh, and up very and down. Huh? We let people go through the different questions, and yeah. they got some context later. Yeah, because we, we don't have that. Change. For example, yeah. uh, we just said next, yeah. next. So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that kind of uh, thing will matter a lot for the tests. And yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I guess in another future work, yes. that thing is to devise um, a stricter set of guidelines for mm -hmm. existing evaluation. Okay, so I think we should switch over to the next yeah. speaker. Yes. I have another meeting, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> we would like to